Thank you, thank you so very much, and it's wonderful to be here in the Bay Area among friends. Uh, again, my name is Jerome Ringo, and I flew in from my home state of Louisiana. All right. And of course, I, as I can imagine, those that cheered know Louisiana well because of our festivals and Mardi Gras, because of great food, because of many wonderful things, gumbo and Zotico music. But Louisiana is known for things that I am not as proud of. Louisiana is known for that corridor of land that exists between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana, about a 110-mile stretch known as Cancer Alley. It is known as Cancer Alley because it is the home of about 300 petrochemical sites separated by poor neighborhoods. We are also known for hurricanes, for I am an evacuee of Hurricane Katrina. I am as well an evacuee of Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Gustav, and Hurricane Ike. And I have been asked by the organizers of Bioneers that whenever I finish this speech to get on a plane so that I do not attract a hurricane to the Bay Area. <laughs> But I'm really excited to be here before a, such a wonderful and like-minded audience because we share the concerns that face not only America today, but the planet as a whole. We share in the realities of the challenges that we face on a daily basis, whether it be economic challenges or, environmentally challenge, or environmental challenges. We face them all together. And the reality that we live with is that we face a problem on the earth today unlike any that we have ever seen in the form of climate change. We face the reality of a melting ice cap at Kilimanjaro. We face the reality of a melting Greenland, a melting permafrost under the feet of the Gwich'in tribe in northern Alaska. We face the reality of a coastline in Louisiana that because of sea level rise and channeling of the waterways, we are losing in my home state an acre of land every 42 minutes to erosion. We are faced with the reality of a Katrina that 50% of the population of, Louis, of New Orleans was displaced, primarily the poor and people of color. We live with, with the reality that the levees have now been rebuilt in New Orleans at the same standards that they were prior to Katrina, with the promise of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that not worry people of New Orleans, we will have them up to Category 5 standards by 2018. <laughs> we live with the reality that we are facing an unemployment rate today of 9.8 percent nationally, and in states like Michigan, they face a 15-plus percent unemployment rate, and cities like Flint, Michigan, a 25.6 percent unemployment. We live in the reality of the U.S. steel workers losing 100,000 jobs three weeks before last Christmas. We live in the reality that we are facing tough economic times, a time when jobs are being exported and energy is being imported. 70% of our fossil fuel energy we import from other countries. Not one of our transformers on our grid system is made in America. We, we live in the reality that we invented photovoltaic material in the United States, but now when we want to build a photovoltaic cell, most more times than not, we must import the components. We live in a time when we make up 5% of the world's population, discharge 35% of the CO2 to the atmosphere, and use 25% of the world's energy, Yet we have still not ratified Kyoto. 
on the eve of a Copenhagen, when now we go into a Copenhagen with a bit more optimism than a Kyoto, I was a delegate at Kyoto, and I will be a delegate at Copenhagen. But we go into a Copenhagen with a level of optimism, because now we have an administration who gets it and has proven that they get it by committing $110 billion to the green sector, by committing $5 billion toward weatherization and helping poor people's homes be more energy efficient, by committing $38 billion for energy efficient programs and $10.9 billion to a smart grid system. They've committed a billion dollars toward job training, and I hold the training piece very dear to my heart because in order for us to prepare that next generation of leaders in America to be the workers in this new green economy and get America back on its feet again, we must train that next generation. But we must train from K through 12 and beyond. We must erase the battle with our children of nature versus Nintendo. We must get our kids from away from the video game and putting their hands in the dirt and smelling the air and sitting under a tree and feeling nature and becoming connected again with Mother Earth. This is the beginning of creating that generation and preparing that generation that is yet unborn for what we are about to leave them. We are about to leave our children with a mess. And we are about to leave our children with the responsibility to fix it. What we can do now is make an investment, an investment and be a catalyst to get the ball rolling so that our children will at least have a chance to turn this mess around. We must begin with building a coalition, a coalition of Americans that look like America. I joined the Louisiana Wildlife Federation in 1994 because I believed in Louisiana that in order for the poor and of color community to have a voice, we needed to engage with organized conservation. I had no idea when I joined that organization in 1994 and its 24,000 members that I was the only black member. <laughs> and though that is quite shocking, today they have about 19,000 members and today I am still the only black member. Well, you say shame on Louisiana, but I traveled to Florida and to California and to Washington and Illinois and Maine and North Carolina. And I found that there was a major lack of diversity in the conservation movement throughout this country. I'm the first person of color to head a major conservation organization in the history of this country. And that's a wonderful thing, but that's a very sad thing. Because the conservation movement is over 100 years old. And I sought to better understand why we are where we are with such lack of diversity and separation in the movement. And I sought to understand. I visited one day with a dear friend of mine by the name of Teddy Roosevelt IV. And Teddy shared with me that when his great granddaddy was president, and back in 1936 when President Roosevelt founded the National Wildlife Federation, people that were conservationists were sportsmen. They were the ones that would go out and fish and hang the fish on the wall. Folks that were fishing to put a fish on a plate in southern Mississippi did not join clubs. 
and they could not afford to anyway. And so the movement evolved as a predominantly white male movement. And as we evolved into the 60s and the 70s, the movement continued to be segregated because poor people were more concerned about next month's rent than the demise of the polar bear or depletion of the ozone layer. But now we live in a time that we all drink the water and we all breathe the air and we all must be involved. Even though people of color and poor people suffer the greatest disproportionate impact of poor environmental practices, two out of three African Americans live within the same zip code of a landfill. If you want to find a black neighborhood, you find a railroad track. If you want to find a sewage treatment plant, you find a Hispanic neighborhood. And initially, I thought it was an issue of race. But as I traveled to the Texas-Mexican border, and I saw that the people that suffered the greatest exploitation were poor and brown, and I traveled to urban communities like Los Angeles and Chicago, Detroit, People in the urban communities that were adversely impacted by poor environmental practices were poor and black. But I made a trip to West Virginia, coal mining country, where they were stripping the mountains like they were shaving a face. And the people that were adversely impacted were poor and white. And I came to the realization that the issue was not solely an issue of color but an issue of economics. And it is the time that we must now push a public policy that demands equity, but we must also push a public policy that is going to demand that America as a whole, America as a nation, be put back to work again. The American manufacturing industry has suffered tremendously. And now we're seeing movement through bills like Senator Sherrod Brown's Impact Act that is going to ensure that small businesses and small manufacturing companies can now have help in developing the components that we need to rebuild America. We need not continue to import every part we need in this new green economy. We put man on the moon in the 60s. The program was called Apollo. That is why the organization of which I head is called the Apollo Alliance, because we face our own moonshot mission today. And as President John F. Kennedy said in 1961, that man could be on the moon in 10 years. Well, America, we did not do it in 10. We did it in eight. And with that same passion and energy and commitment of the American people and public investment and public policy that put the eagle on the moon, we now have our own moonshot mission. And that mission is to clean up the environment. That mission is to stimulate the American economy and to declare energy independence so that we can get off of the oil barrel that we're being held over by foreign governments. The new Apollo Alliance program that was birthed in 2003 talked about an American investment, an investment of about $500 billion over 10 years. That's about $50 billion a year. Boy, $50 billion sounds like a whole lot of money, and it is. But it doesn't sound like so much when you talk about investing $50 billion into putting people back to work again when we've just invested $90-plus billion in bailing out AIG. Yeah. How about investing in America? How about investing in that steel worker who is out of work and who daily must stand at the gas pump and make a decision as to whether they purchase a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk? How about investing in that school teacher in California 
who is out of work because the state is in such financial in, uh, trouble. How about investing into an America that has pride in building and manufacturing, who no longer has work because we have exported the jobs to other countries? How about investing in an America who can take the lead in research and development because we have the brilliant minds in our elementary, middle school, and high schools, and in American universities and community colleges? How about investing in those people that are the wind beneath the wings of this great country and put America back to work once again? No longer can it be an issue of red states or blue states. It must be an issue of red, white, and blue. But it must be an issue that is wrapped around the greatest opportunity for change that we have ever faced in our lives, and that is an opportunity to green America, to green America through manufacturing, but green America through a public policy that will help America get on its feet again. The stimulus package is a great thing, but the stimulus package will not save America. It is only a down payment. It is only an investment. And it is banking on the spirits of great Americans like you to take this ball and go forward and prepare the next generation to be the leaders in manufacturing, to be the leaders in public policy, to be the leaders of the world, to supply the components, to supply all that we need to satisfy America's and the world's appetite for energy. We must make sure that we develop a diversified energy portfolio. When Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana in 2005, every oil rig on the Gulf of Mexico was shut down. One third of the domestic oil supply was shut down. And you saw the result of the gas pump. Imagine if on that very day, if the Venezuelans and the Saudis and the Iraqis and the Iranians and the Russians and the West Indians, imagine if they would have decided to close the valves. America would have been brought to its knees. It is because we have been so one-dimensional with respect to our energy. We now must, must develop a diversified energy portfolio, but whatever is considered as part of that portfolio must be environmentally friendly. Sure, people are going to come up with new ideas. And one of the concerns about this new energy is that it is so expensive. That is why research and development is so important. You can remember, some of us, most of you young people don't remember this, but remember when cell phones were the size of a shoebox? <laughs> we carried them under our arms with straps like boom boxes. And they cost about $2,500 a phone. And, and now, because of research and development to make the, the, the phone more efficient, now you can take a cell phone and slip it into your pocket and practically get them for free. And who would have imagined that there would be industries spurring off of cell phones like the multi-million dollar industry called ringtones? It is because of a plan to, re to do research and development, but major investment to make a product better and make it more appealing, which makes it more marketable, which drives the price down, and America makes money. But we've got to make those products here in America, made in America. I am not opposed to manufactured items in other countries. I am not opposed to that. But what I am opposed to are the six and 700,000 jobs that we're losing each quarter in some states when those opportunities can be here in America. I want to challenge each and every one of you with respect to the new green economy and surely with, with respect to the challenges that we face in the area of climate change 
I want to challenge you as I challenged a group of people that I sat on stage with last year in Berlin. It was the CEO of a major American oil company, which will remain nameless. And that was the CEO of a major uh, a store chain. I won't call Walmart's name. <laughs> but I challenged them, and I looked into their eyes, and I said, gentlemen, do you have grandchildren? And they nodded and said yes. And I want to pose the same challenge to each of you. Each of you may have a grandchild or a child or one day may have grandchildren. And when your grandchild 10 years from now or your child looks into your eyes and says, Mom, Dad, Grandmom, Granddad, Kilimanjaro's ice cap has melted. The permafrost in Alaska has disappeared. Greenland, the ice pump of the planet, has stopped turning. We have no idea when summer will end and winter will begin. There is drought, there is tornado, there is climatic variations like never before. The temperature has risen another degree or two. Grandmama, granddaddy, mom, dad, you said to me that each year you attended this Bioneers conference. <laughs> and I did too. Why did you let this happen? And I posed that question to the gentleman on the stage that were head of organizations or companies, and I pose that same question to you. Unemployment is on a rise. The economy is floundering. The environment is collapsing. We still have not ratified a Kyoto. We should be the leader in that arena. Why and how did we let this happen? And if you today do not have an answer for your grandkids or your kids, let the Bioneers Conference of 2009 be the beginning of your answer. Make a personal commitment when you leave this place that I am going to use every bit of the passion that is within me and the energy that abounds me to make sure that when my child or grandchild asks me that question, that I can give them an answer that I can be proud of. This is our moonshot moment. This is our opportunity to announce to the world that the eagle has landed. Thank you very much.